It's time for the Splash Live from Civic Center TV, featuring stories from and about people like you in the greater West Bloomfield area. Simulcast on cable, 89.3 Lakes FM, social media, and the web. Now live from Green Media Center on Walnut Lake Road, it's the Splash Live! Live, local, social, it's the Splash Live on Civic Center TV and 89.3 Lakes FM. I'm Tyler Keeft alongside Kevin McIntosh. And Kevin, glad to be with you again on this Wednesday. Oh, so glad to be with you also, Tyler. Another day, another opportunity to talk to the community, and I'll never take it for granted. Let's get to it, let's get to it Tyler. Yeah, hopefully a better day ahead for the greater West Bloomfield area after a very hot Tuesday and a very stormy Tuesday Ooh, as well, yeah. especially Tuesday evening. Significant storms rolling all throughout Oakland County and southeastern Michigan, leaving hundreds of thousands out of power in greater West Bloomfield. That includes over 200,000 customers through DTE or roughly 9% of their customer base. Here we got some images we'll put up on your screen. Uh, this first image shows some of the significant areas of power outages in our, in our community. Uh, you'll see a little bit of Orchard Lake and West Bloomfield on this image on civiccentertv.com. Pockets around the Orchard Lake Nature Sanctuary and around the West Acres region and Twin Beach area of West Bloomfield with 203 customers and 1,521 customers in that West Acres region respectively without power at this time. In addition, other problem areas across our neighborhoods include in West Bloomfield in the Maple and Middle Belt area, as well as that business corridor in Orchard Lake around Maple and M10, around 844 people out of power between those two areas in our community. Then uh, also that includes significant pockets of the Tri-Cities. We mentioned Orchard Lake a moment ago, but Kegel Harbor, Sylvan Lake, and a little bit of that border area with West Bloomfield ex uh, experiencing significant power outages as we enter this day after those big storms. Uh, it includes 1,200 people out of power. Most of that included in the green section on your screen here on civiccentertv.com. That is almost all of Kegel Harbor in that image or a significant portion of Kegel Harbor from as south as Cass Lake to even as north as Beachmont where 931 of those 1,200 customers are without power at the time that we're telling you this on, on Wednesday. Then additionally some wind damage also causing some significant damage around the Sylvan, the Sylvan Glen area as well. Here are some images from Chantel Hoffarth uh, posted on Facebook including Sylvan Glen of a tree that fell on a power line sparking a fire in our community. Another angle on that we'll get you in just a moment from Kim Schultz who showed that tree was down, hit a power line. Luckily, uh, per the Facebook post and those comments, did not hit any, any uh, people or, uh, or their homes in those areas. Just the damage to those trees with the fire and you saw in that image previously the fire department also on scene for that. Then at Ward's Point uh, there's been a couple of different shots there from Julianne O'Brien showing a tree falling across the street and we have Jake Schaff from our team on site in that area as we speak who's been able to speak to some people from within our community uh, about this damage and, and learn a little bit more from live on site in Kego Harbor, this area around around Kendall and Elon. Jake, give us the latest. Yes, Tyler, Kevin, good morning. A bit of a cloudy morning after the night we had last night, but yes, I'm here live on Cass Lake Road around the intersection of Cass Lake and Summers. And as you can take a look behind me, this is only some of the damage that was caused from the storms last night. Trees down, uh, power lines impacted, and just damage throughout the roads. I was speaking with uh, worker just a little bit earlier before the show who was cleaning up some of the debris asking him some of the things that he's seen and he's been hopping around uh the four communities all day trying to clean up little things here and there he told me that a transformer actually blew up around sylvan glen and just little bits here and there doing his part to help make get everything back to normal but yes there has been some destruction it's definitely going to cause some road delays and probably going to cause some uh rerouting but yes, uh, definitely a lot of the stuff you see around here, Tyler. Yeah, expect to see a lot of crews out today also uh, cleaning up a lot of that storm damage, those trees that are down, especially those significant trees. You talked about the one on Sylvan and Glen, and, and we're able to get some information that it was a transformer that blew as that uh, tree uh, apparently had fallen onto that power line. Jake, thank you for 
uh, that report at this time? Have, have you gotten any indication of maybe from the crew that's on site there when we can expect this area of, of Kendall and Elam around Castle Lake where you're at, where that tree is down to be cleared? As for when things are going to be back to normal, I'm not 100% sure, but okay. hopefully this thing, these, this stuff will get cleaned up very, very soon as to not impact too many drivers as they, as they continue on in their day. Yeah, hopefully that will be the case and, and that storm damage and those power outages also coupled on top of that. Got to make it tough for people to be able to clear this damage as well. Maybe they're using uh, chainsaws that have to be connected to a power supply. They need to charge some of those materials. A lot tougher to do when you're also in significant pockets of power outages across our community. Jake Schaff, live in Kegel Harbor. Thank you so much. Absolutely, Tyler. Thank you. Appreciate it. And Kevin, that's really what this is all about this morning is the damage that we've seen in our communities. It's come in, in two different ways. It's power outages. It is significant storm damage or in some areas of our community. You think about Kego Harbor and, and what we saw from there. We think about the areas of Sylvan Glen and Wards Point. It's both in some cases. Yeah, and this is unfortunate, but it happens around this time of year when we get these these storms, this hot weather mixed with the storms. So, you know, we will hope that some people were prepared for, you know, maybe storing some, some things in your refrigerator or your freezer so it doesn't spoil or even have a generator on hand or charging your phone and things way in advance or in your car, whatever the case may be. But we are hoping that the crews, you know, work uh, uh, and get things turned over quickly, but we want to be patient with them also. Yeah, over 2 million people across Metro Detroit are without power. According to DTE Energy on their outage map website, which is outage.dteenergy.com, you can search your address and find more information on your power outage specifically to report your power outage or to get more information on when crews are expected to restore power in your area. They've put on this that they are putting over 1,200 line workers from outside the area in the field today to help address these power outages. And they do expect 90% of customers impacted by the storm to have their power restored by the end of the day on Thursday. So many should expect today to not be without power in the Greater West Bloomfield area and for much of Thursday possibly as well. Take those precautions that you may need and those steps forward. In terms of storm damage, it can cause a number of different hazards in our local area. And we've already seen some of those hazards come into play from these storms earlier on this week. Here to give us some more insight on some safety, on some safety steps that we can take to address that storm damage and keep ourselves safe going forward is Captain Michael Wood from the West Bloomfield uh, Fire Department. Captain Wood, thank you for being with us. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Yeah, glad to have you on to talk about this because it is a significant time for our community dealing with the storm damage, as so many other communities are. So let's start off with where the fire department comes into play and in all of that. How does your department uh, prepare itself for these sorts of moments, knowing severe weather is coming in and you may need to be out in the field significantly to help clear and protect people from hazards? Well, the, the first part is obviously life safety, um, not only for the fire department crew, but also for the, for the citizens. So um, people paying attention to the, to the weather um, alerts, uh, having a weather radio in the house is always an awesome idea. Uh, battery powered one as well, that when the power goes out, the, uh, the radio will still alert. Um, we do training on the fire department on how to handle excess calls. Um, we're a giant team, not only with the fire department, but also with our dispatch and our police department. So when all those 911 calls start coming into our dispatch center, they get they get overburdened with all the different types of calls. So we see that overburden and we try to help them out. We start taking all those wires down, the trees down, and we'll start dispatching and worrying about what trucks, what personnel to send to different locations. So it kind of eases dispatch up for the emergencies of medicals, fires, drownings, um, all that other high pri higher priority things. In a situation like this, Captain Wood, where we had so much 
uh, high winds that caused a lot of storm damage, where, whether it's downed trees or uh, significant branches, power lines also come into play. Uh, what have been some of the more significant challenges or hazards that have been presented by this particular storm's damage? So just the the amount of trees down, that was those the trees that are blocking the roads, that's our largest concern, not only for uh, getting in and out of neighborhoods for the residents and for the fire department, but at nighttime, you don't want to come around a corner doing 45 miles an hour and here's a tree across the road in the dark when it's wet. You're not going to see it. So um, our major goal is opening up roads, clearing the paths so that people can travel safely. Uh, this storm, we had a lot of down trees. We had a lot of down wires, um, mostly caused by tree branches falling and, and pulling the um, pulling the wires off the poles. Uh, let's see, what else did we have? Um, we had uh, boats get knocked loose on different lakes, um, possible missing persons on lakes. Um, all of them were, were handled quickly and investigated, and luckily there was no uh, injuries, no loss of life uh, in West Bloomfield, so that's, that's a good thing. Everybody did very well. And it's a really good time, too, because of, the, because of the circumstances of this damage, particularly those trees falling down. Uh, you did mention some power line issues. We did have a power line that was struck in the Sylvan Glen area of our community that did spark into a fire that was, uh, that was shown earlier on in our program. So for residents that are in those areas that do experience storm damage, they see a down branch, they see it's in the area of a power line, how should they first address that to a, see if it is uh, affecting their power line, or B, to address any safety hazards that may come with an interaction between a branch, a tree, and a power line? Right. So um, really, you want to you want to be able to look at the telephone poles, the, the power poles, yeah. and trace all those wires that are coming off of that, making sure that they stay in the air. Um, if you see a wire coming in and it's not going out on the other side, it kind of tells you, okay, it's it's somewhere, and it's somewhere down on the ground. Stay away and just report that. Let us uh, come in and investigate it, and then we can even turn that over. We always do turn it over to uh, Edison to investigate it more or to, um, not Edison, I'm sorry, Detroit Edison. Yeah, Detroit yeah. Edison. And, and um, then, yeah. Oh, please continue. Yeah, and then uh, if you're out of power, uh, generators. G generators are a wonderful thing, um, but they're also a sneaky thing. Uh, they produce carbon monoxide and the exhaust from that, uh, you got to make sure that the generator is the furthest away from your house as possible with the exhaust pointing away from your house. Having it in your garage with your garage door open is not a good idea. You got to get it outside and then manually close your garage door down um, to just above where that extension cord is coming in. Um, that way the exhaust fumes do not come into the house and they stay outside. Uh, carbon monoxide is, is no joking matter. Uh, yes, you can smell the exhaust from the generator, but carbon monoxide is odorless, colorless, tasteless. You, you, you'll, you just don't know that. So that also leads into carbon monoxide detectors in the house. Um, having the battery-powered carbon monoxide detectors is an uh, absolute must if you have any gas-powered equipment that you're going to be running. All good advice during this time as we reflect on storm damage from earlier on this week that caused significant numbers of branches that were down, trees that fell across our community, and a significant number of power outages. So a really good point with those generators if people are using them to, to keep those precautions in place so that, look, you have your power back on but and you've resolved that problem for now, but you don't want to create more of those problems down the line. Captain Michael Wood is with us from the West Bloomfield Fire Department. More helpful tips from the fire department can be found on their Facebook page, facebook.com slash WB Fire Department, or you can uh, visit them on their website at wbtownship.com. 
www.ptwood.org. Captain Wood, in terms of power outages, we know that they can cause a number of hazards for people that remain in their homes or, or do not have those generators, either A, from within their home or even those devices as power may be coming on and off in the coming days as DTE addresses these power outages across our community and beyond. What, what steps should people be taking in their homes to keep themselves safe while the power is out and uh, while that power is being restored? So something I do at my house, I unplug all the TVs. I love my TVs. Um, we've invested money in them. I don't want to see those get affected by a brownout or by surges. So I, I get those TVs unplugged, even though they're in a surge protector, um, one of those uh, outlets, those strip outlets. Um, other things, uh, checking on neighbors, uh, making sure your neighbors are okay, uh, seeing if they have any needs. If you're the one that has a, a generator, offer them a helping hand with, uh, you know, maybe taking some of their perishables and keeping them in your refrigerator so that they have less loss for their items. Um, that's really, that's really it. Just checking on neighbors. And then lastly, Captain Wood, if people have more questions, if they're concerned about things that may be happening in their community, maybe aren't necessarily emergencies, but are things that are a cause for concern, what steps should they then take to get in contact with the fire department and maybe address some of those issues? Any concern, call 911. That's what we're here for. Sorry, I got a bunch of alarms going off. That's okay. Only Action packed um, for the fire yeah, department, so we understand, it, please continue. It is. It's been a busy night and, and probably going to continue to be a busy day. But, um, yeah, call 911. Uh, we're here. We're available. Uh, it may take us a little bit of time um, to get to you. Uh, but if it's a higher priority call, we'll get there pretty quick. We're, we're good at navigating through traffic, through down trees, and, and we'll get there. And we'll check up on you. And and see what we can do to help. That's our goal. We want to help our citizens. We want to help our citizens stay uh, in, a, in a happy place and, and take that burden off their shoulders. Let us take it and navigate through the problems together. Captain Michael Wood with us from the West Bloomfield Fire Department. We appreciate your time. We know it's a busy day, a lot to get to to help our residents in our local area and clear a lot of this storm damage. We'll let you get back to it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a wonderful day. Stay safe. You as well. Updates always available on Facebook.com slash WB Fire Department. You'll be able to get any updates from them or even additional tips leading up to the next set of storms that may come up throughout the rest of this summer as we transition into fall or any other safety tips that you may need to know from our West Bloomfield Fire Department, which, of course, as we know, Kevin covers all four of our communities through, of course, West Bloomfield and the Tri-City Fire Board Agreement as well. So they are going to have a very busy day as well their par partners in the Oakway Collective too, addressing many of these issues, Kevin, as we've seen that significant storm damage really taking a toll in our community, something we haven't really seen of late when the severe weathers come through this summer. And he brought up some solid points. Also, yeah. the fact that especially overnight when a storm is happening and the trees are, are falling and things of that nature, you have to take extreme precaution, especially if you're driving on the road, because you don't know where these trees are falling. You don't know. You can't even see at night and things of that nature. So, it, like we said, if we even see a severe storm coming up, as much as we can prepare, try to prepare as possible, have a generator, check on your neighbors, things of that nature. He made some very, very solid points there. Yeah, you want to talk about taking some alternative routes today. Uh, we mentioned that with Jake, especially for that area of Kegel Harbor he was in. It was at Cast Lake Road around Kendall and Elon. We know there's been some down trees around there, around Ward's Point. There's been some down trees. Not really an alternative route there if you're beyond where that tree has fallen and you mm -hmm. have to navigate around it. It did look like it was off the road in that area. So that's the one lucky point of this. And uh, definitely keep yourself safe. Don't overburden yourself. It's still going to be a rather warm day and humid day here. So clearing a lot of that storm mm -hmm. damage, keep an eye on yourself and on your health and be safe in that way. And as, the, and as Captain Wood said, if you have an emergency, if you even think there is a potential for that emergency, better to call 911, get a crew out there from the fire department, from the police department, from our first responders and address that issue than to wave it off as 
a maybe emergency and have it turn into a real one with significant damage. So hopefully everybody gets through these next couple of days safe, gets that power back quickly. And in the mm -hmm. meantime, more information again from the fire department, facebook.com slash WB fire department, as well as on the DTE outage map, a really good resource to go to for information on power outages in our community. If you need to know or you want to get updates on when your power may be restored here in Greater West Bloomfield. Kevin, people can expect further delays across our community already underway. If in certain subdivisions of Greater West Bloomfield, the Road Commission announcing via a press release earlier this week, they, they have shut down Shore Hill Drive just east of Middle Belt, north of West Long Lake Road, and just south of Square Lake Road because of significant deterioration of a culvert over there. Not something uncommon we've seen in our community in other areas. The Road Commission yeah. planning to address many of these damaged or aged culverts in the coming years to do those necessary infrastructure repairs. But uh, this navigates the street over the Upper Long Lake Canal, and that's a significant area of concern. It's a 66-year-old culvert. They have been managing uh, and trying to mitigate while also monitoring that damage and that deterioration over the years and in recent year, recent months, my apologies, it's become much more significant. So the Road Commission deciding as they began this week to shut down that area of our community. The closure to those streets began Monday. Yeah. It's estimated it's going to be quite a while before we'll see that culvert uh, and that part of that street reopen in our community with the Road Commission hopefully uh, going to be getting funding to repair that culvert by 2026. Now, however, it's a long way away, mm. but you're not going to be completely cut off from your usual route. There are alternative routes available. Other streets around that area of Shore Hill Drive are still open at this time to navigate that subdivision street. But people in that area or who will be going through that area to visit friends, to visit families, to go home should be aware of that going on. Uh, more information on this and other uh, construction updates can be found on rcocweb.org org or on Facebook at Roadcom. Kevin, as we see infrastructure continue to be something of emphasis from our Road Commission going forward and these culverts continuing to be one of those points of emphasis where we're seeing a lot of repairs ahead. I was going to say the exact same thing. Yeah, we're, we're seeing a lot of repairs at the culverts, but I mean, it's it's one of those unnecessary things. I mean, I'm uncon unconvenient things i should say but it's necessary to get done i should say so i mean ultimately we just have to be patient and weigh it out and thank goodness we have alternative routes to still get to our home of course so uh you know hopefully fingers crossed something happens where it's a little bit quicker than 2026 but nonetheless just find alternative ways be patient and we'll figure this out yeah in the meantime plenty of other construction that we'll have much more significant impact on your commute day to day, but something to keep aware of uniquely right here in our community. In addition, something that affects right. not only people here in Greater West Bloomfield, but all throughout our local area, especially our senior citizens, are scams. Scam artists are always finding new ways to target mm -hmm. people in vulnerable communities, especially using technology that is available today and is developing over time. So some local leaders in our community planning later this week to help our seniors learn more about ways they can prevent falling victim to these scams. This will happen at a special town hall event in West Bloomfield on Friday this week at West Bloomfield Parks Connect hosted by uh, Representative Noah Arbit in partnership with Attorney General Dana Nessel, the West Bloomfield Police Department, West Bloomfield Parks, and of course, you, the seniors in our community looking to find this information. Joining us to talk more about what this panel will discuss on that Friday event in West Bloomfield is West Bloomfield Police Department Chief Michael Patton on the show with us today. We appreciate having you on. Take us through, while we get started, what this panel will mainly be addressing as it talks to our seniors on Friday. Well, this uh, presentation will be on Friday, August 30th at the West Bloomfield uh, Parks Connect facility at 14 Mile and Haggerty. And it's actually, it's being hosted by our Parks and Rec Department. But the sponsor of it is our state representative, Noah Arbit from the 20th district here, who's been very active in the district, uh, is a, a grew up here and also is uh, very passionate about doing everything uh, good and well here in West Bloomfield. But one of the other primary hosts will also be our state attorney general, Dana Nessel who's really a leader in the state here of uh, putting out information and resources for everybody, but also seniors about how to prevent uh, and minimize their risk for scams and frauds. 
And I encourage everybody, really, Tyler, to actually go on to the Attorney General's website. And she has a wealth of information on there about how to minimize and prevent frauds from happening. And there's really something new that pops up very, you know, almost every day. And she's very uh, a good leader about putting out the contemporary risks in, in those. Now, there's always a lot of common themes in these risks. You know, people trying to get information out of you, get sensitive information, uh, health care information, medical records numbers, social security numbers, and other things so that they can eventually perpetuate a fraud upon you in some way, shape, or form. And so I think one of the main talking issues of concern for me, for everybody, but particularly for seniors, is that really they keep up on this and that they have a skepticism if someone contacts them and starts asking them for information. Yeah, because gone on are the days where these scam attempts were relatively simple. It was a, a phone call that seemed innocent and well-intentioned that you know, maybe your grandparents were answering and they gave out some information and then months later would, would learn the hard way that their information had been compromised. Maybe they lost some money or they had some erroneous bills or they get something in the mail. But today there's so much technology out there and our seniors are active in using these technologies too. What are some of the more common ways we're seeing these scams be perpetuated in our community, particularly toward our seniors in these modern times? Well, first off, there's always the very technical kind of scams where you'll get an email that may look very official or maybe something you had expressed an interest in earlier. And all they want you to do is eventually click on a link or open up at something else within that email. And it may allow them to gather information off your computer or they'll ask you a simple question to provide information and that'll be the information that they need to you know, further a fraud or a scam. And those are always cautionary tales that, so you really wanna be skeptical about what you get in an email and don't click on a link and don't share information. And again, some of these uh, frauds are, they're very deceptive. They look very legitimate. It could be something that looks like it's coming from your bank or it looks like it could be coming from uh, a person you've been in communication with before, but it's not. And it's the cautionary tale that you should be have some skepticism before you open something. The other type of frauds are the ones that you already referenced, that ones are uh, have been historical, where they call up and they get someone's attention or maybe evoke some emotion that a relative is in jail or they need some money. And they'll get them to uh, go to the bank and uh, withdraw some money and send them something. Um, and again, those things are always frauds. Again, if relatives in jail there's ways to check on those uh, check on that or check with other family members so not going to the bank i've always been very happy over the years when i see people make interventions in these kind of incidents where uh, a person sometimes often a senior will go to a bank and withdraw money to you know to send to somebody and a an attentive teller or someone will ask them why are you doing this and they'll start telling the story of what the story they've been told and really it stops those frauds from being perpetuated. But they're not always successful. And we've seen people um, uh, give up and surrender significant amounts of money and what they think is the, the right thing to help somebody and it's not, it's a fraud and they're being defrauded. And though we take a very good strong effort to investigate those crimes, they're difficult times. And really uh, a person who's perpetuating these kind of crimes, all they have to do, they could call 100 people and all they have to do is be right once and it's probably a good day in the office for Yeah, really all, all it takes is one incident for that information to be stolen from somebody in our community, that information to be out there in our community, and ultimately for people to be affected by scams in a number of different ways that can last them for a number of years also as they're trying to deal with the aftermath of these issues. Joining us on the Splash Live, Chief Michael Patton of the West Bloomfield Police Department. Uh, he will be participating as well as other local leaders, including Attorney General Dana Nessel, State Representative Noah Arbit, Oakland County Commissioner Marsha Gershenson, and Ageways Representative Stephanie Hall at a town hall meeting about this at West Bloomfield Parks Connect next week, Friday, August 30th at 12 noon. That's on 14 Mile Road in West Bloomfield. RSVP on WBParks.org or you can call them at 248-451-1900 for more information. And you mentioned earlier on, Chief Patton, that this is being ran mostly by our local elected leaders to, uh, who organized this particular meeting with West Bloomfield Parks. And so how, how does law enforcement and then our local leadership and government, our state representatives, our state senators, our attorney general, how do you work in partnership to help to ultimately 
prevent these legislatively or by putting other regulations in place that help everyday citizens right here in greater West Bloomfield? Well, there's already a, a, you know, a, a plethora of laws that apply to this. So, you know, law enforcement very often were uh, regrettably, unfortunately, you know, responsive after an incident or a crime has been committed. And we try and seek justice to identify the alleged perpetrators and then initiate them into a criminal justice system. We also try to, you know, but we also participate in programs like on August 30th event where it's informative, where we can we can prevent these kind of crimes through information sharing and, and awareness and reminding people that there's a lot of people out there every day that may want to try to defraud you and take you know, money away from you. And it, 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 we need you to be aware of these kind of frauds and be skeptical sometimes when someone reaches out to you for personal information. There's a lot of information out there, Tyler, and we always encourage people to do this or help other family members help them with you. I already mentioned that the Attorney General's website is a wealth of information. Uh, you look on the Ageways website, there are strong advocates for in information and advocacy for seniors and can help out with things on Meals on Wheels and direct home care services and advocacy and transportation assistance. There's services for seniors there. I would also recommend to people that they look on the website of our Oakland County Clerk and Register of Deeds, Lisa Brown. She's a strong advocate for fraud protection with re regards to property records. Um, you can sign up for what's called her property records notification program. And this is a program that you'll enter. It's very simple to sign up. I've already done it uh, where you can list your uh, home address there and you will get an email alert if someone puts a false or malicious lien on your property. Now, it wouldn't prevent that from being happened, but you'll get a timely email alert that somebody has put a lien on your property so that you can make a timely response to it and not later or years later when you look to transfer the property. And that time can be huge in preventing these issues from growing and becoming massive problems in our lives and especially those of our seniors here in the greater West Bloomfield community. We know these scams are not uncommon to seniors across all communities across the U.S. In fact, Forbes putting, uh, sorry, Fortune putting out a, an article recently, elderly Americans are losing $28 billion a year to scams and some are fighting back uh, as well on that with different different methods, including these informational sessions that will be hap like what will be happening at uh, West Bloomfield Parks Connect coming up next week. Chief, hope, what do you hope that people from the community that attend this ultimately get out of this? What opportunity will they have beyond just hearing from our leaders to get their questions answered? Well, I think it's always great. Again, uh, Representative Arbit and Attorney General Nestle, they grew up in this area. This was this is their hometown at one point. And so they're very passionate about helping us out West Bloomfield on everything. Uh, look, it's, hopefully it'll be, it, it'll be informative. It'll help elevate awareness on these issues, particularly for our seniors. It'll also provide them with some resources that if they have any questions or concerns, who and where they can reach out for help. And that's primarily what we want them to do. You know, look, I'm a seasoned citizen too. We have had a lot of life experiences, but even you know the best of us sometimes can be lured down a dark path where uh, it's something seems inviting or enticing or interesting, and you know. But our life experiences would generally protect us, and all we're trying to provide is additional information and resources so they can reach out to us if when they need us. That information, those resources will be available next week, August 30th, that's a Friday at 12 noon at West Bloomfield Parks Connect Senior Center on 14 Mile Road in West Bloomfield. Chief Patton, thank you so much for your time and your insight. Thank you for inviting me this morning. Happy to have you on, Chief, as, as we get ready for a very important conversation on Friday afternoon about, about scam prevention in our community. Again, if you want to learn more about that, wbparks.org is the place to go for more information or on their Facebook page at WB Parks to get more on who's going to be speaking there, kind of what it'll be all about and to invite your friends and other seniors across the community to learn more information on a very important topic that could save your personal information from a lot of harm. On a much more positive note, we are back to school here in Greater West Bloomfield, and with back to school means back to high school sports as well. So much excitement happening over at West Bloomfield High School as they get through the first week of the school year and move on throughout the fall. And joining us to talk about all the fun happening in the athletics department at West Bloomfield High School is the athletic director, Eric Pierce. Eric, thanks for being with us today. 
Oh, good morning, Tyler. Thank you so much, as always, for having me on. Yeah, happy to have you on as we kick off the school year and we kick off all these different sports seasons, some of them already underway or soon to get underway. Fall really is an exciting time, I'd imagine, for the athletes because for a lot of them, maybe they haven't played sports since the spring or this is their season. So now what's the vibe sort of been like from the teams coming into 2024? Yeah, we're excited. Uh, got a lot of great things going on in athletics at West Bloomfield, as always. Um, you know, our soccer team's off to a wonderful start already. They've had four games. They're three and one. Uh, and we've, we've got a, a student, Kanan Eldorazak, who's who scored 11 goals in those four games already. So obviously starting off to uh, a, a great start there. Um, but it, it, a lot of passion, a lot of excitement everywhere here. Uh, you know, football starts this week against Chip Valley with our family fun night game at home. Um, volleyball's been been off and running. We have field hockey that's about to start right now. Uh, girls swimming, volleyball, all these different sports that are out here cross country. It's it's really a positive atmosphere, and and uh, we're excited to get it going. And we know that this program, these uh, overall at West Bloomfield High School, this athletic program has taken so many strides in recent years and significant strides in the last decade or so. So how do you keep following that up with the next step forward, especially now as we start off this new school year? What are some of the goals for the next several months with our sports? Well, the goal is just to uphold the values and traditions of West Bloomfield High School. I, I'm, I'm always so proud of our student athletes and how they represent us on the field and also in the classroom. And, and that's what it is. It's all about being a student athlete. It's all about learning how to handle yourself both on and off the field, as I said, and um, you know, being part of something bigger than just yourself. And our students do a wonderful job of that. They recognize what it means to wear a Lakers jersey and they recognize what it means to represent West Bluefield and they wanna do the best for our community. And part of that really goes back to being both an athlete but also being a student. That's part of the character of this program is a lot of these student athletes are not only great on the field, they're great in the classroom too. And you know, how does that continue to be a focal point for all your teams individually and coaches especially as they pass that on to their players week in and week out? Well, we have a, a wonderful staff here, both coaches and teachers at West Bloomfield that, that truly enforce all the positive values that we're trying to try to share and uphold with our student athletes. And you know, they understand that every now and then it's, it's going to take some time away from practice in order to make sure that our students are achieving in the classroom. Uh, you know, they talk to their student athletes about uh, contributing in class and making sure they're on time and, and making sure they show up to class every single day. And it really does do, do wonders for, for how our students achieve. Our, our athletes that are, are also leaders in the classroom and we can go up to our teachers and, and talk to them about how they're performing in the classroom. And they'll, they'll flat out say, hey, they're, they're some of our best students that are out there. And you think about these students, too, that are so prolific on the field. You mentioned your soccer player earlier on, 11 goals in just four games to start off the season. We know that players, even on uh, the football team like Elijah Durham, who had a historic season in his first year on the varsity squad last year, they're going to get opportunities potentially at the next level. And with that, nowadays comes with NIL and building a brand and all of that. And these, these athletes know that that's in their cards when they're playing at West Bloomfield High School. So how does your department then navigate helping them balance school athletics and ultimately their future too when they have these distractions that are just growing nonstop well I, I think the biggest part is is communication and preparation and you know they've, they've been able to see what's happened with the athletes that have been before them and, and and exactly what the process looks like we're very fortunate at West Bloomfield High School with a number of our sports to get a, a lot of coaches that come into our building daily and look for our student athletes because they know the type of athlete that we have there. It's going to be a high achieving person in the classroom while also being a high achiever that's out on the field. Um, and the coaches come in, they talk about expectations, they talk about what, what they feel the student athlete needs to do to succeed. And our coaches reinforce that, our teachers reinforce that, our admin does a wonderful job of reinforcing that. And when it all comes together, that communication and that promotion of the student athlete helps lead to a lot of success for us. It's funny, I was just updating our next level board um, in our athletic hallway, which, which honors all the students that are currently on college rosters uh, from West Bloomfield, and that thing is full. <laughs> it's like we need to get another one up there ASAP. 
Yeah, I've been by there, and, and that board always sticks out to me looking back at some of the players that we've covered over the years and seeing them continuing on at the next level, moving on to different opportunities at that level also. Really great to see from West Bloomfield High School. We're joined by their athletic director, Eric Pierce, on today's edition of The Splash Live. You can find more information on West Bloomfield Athletics all throughout the year. Pretty easy. WestBloomfieldAthletics.com for schedules and tryout information and so much more. But, Eric, ultimately, these sports come back to tying together this West Bloomfield High School and West Bloomfield community in general all together. We're going to get a sense of that later on this week and how it all comes together. But within the walls of West Bloomfield High School, what does athletics do to bring the community together on a widespread fashion? Well, I think I think there's a number of things. You know, obviously you see the, the football games on a Friday night and the community comes out to support or when we have a long run in girls basketball or boys basketball or whatever it is and the community comes out and support, those are fantastic things. But it's also the other um, activities that we take part in. Uh, the community night for girls basketball last year was one of my favorite events where we had fifth graders from our community come out and support our basketball team. They are, had free admission. They got to have a meet and greet with our girls basketball team where they signed autographs and took pictures and did all those things. Those are fantastic events. Um, we had a number of student athletes last year that went down to Scotch Elementary School and read in classrooms for them. Uh, in addition to that, we had some of our football players that participated in almost like a, a mentoring program for some of our students that, that were struggling or learning, needing a mentor in their lives. Those are the types of things that we love doing as a, as a school to help support our community. And I think the community takes notice of that and, and they realize what a wonderful representation our athletics programs are of the community. I think one of the best examples of seeing our community come together around sports, support our athletes on and off the field is when they come out to our football games. And with, with that season getting underway, what's the buzz been like in the building at West Bloomfield High School for this football team? Because we know outside the building, everyone's looking forward to that first game, those first few games at Lakers Stadium. But there's got to be some change that happens when that buzz starts to build for that first game from the students. Yeah, it's exciting. There's there's always excitement around our program, and obviously we get recognized year in and year out as being one of the better teams in the state. Uh, I think the early rankings have us anywhere between like fourth and sixth in the state right now. Um, and we've got a lot of exciting things going on in our program. Uh, you know, we, we look at a, a little bit different of a look than we've had in the past years um, with obviously some of our big names graduating last year, but uh, we have a lot of players that, that were younger that had to step up because of injuries last year that have gotten a lot more playing time um, and experience that's going to help them this year. A uh, couple different names and faces that are out there. Um, obviously, you mentioned Elijah Durham is, uh, is out there again as a wide receiver. He's one of our you know big impact players that's out there on offense. Cam Flowers, uh, Bo Jackson being the quarterback this year for us. Um, replacing Rick Nance, who had been our longtime quarterback. Um, so the face has changed a little bit, but I, I can tell you one thing. We have a ton of talent. Um, we definitely pass the eyeball test when we when we come off the bus with, you know, our, our 6 eight, one tackle, who's, who's uh, Jay Gardenhire and another 6 seven tackle, Travis Robertson. Um, we look the part and we play hard and we're going to represent West Bloomfield well on the football field. Yeah, one, one thing I've learned coming into the season from this team, being around them and, and talking to them about their anticipation of this season, it, it seems like different from years past, this team is more focused on what's ahead of them, and they know the road they have ahead, and they want that more than anything. They want those challenges, and they want to get out in front of it and put forth a great season for Greater West Bloomfield. Uh, Eric Pierce with us on the Splash Live today, athletic director at West Bloomfield High School. Anything else that we should be keeping in mind or uh, be looking out for in the near future from your athletic department uh, definitely you know family fun nights this thursday <laughs> so uh we're actually tomorrow um with family fun night so we look forward to seeing the community out there um and we look forward to celebrating with them as we honor our police military fire everybody that's out there um but uh you know homecoming uh week four uh, against southfield ant is a, is a big event that we'd love to see everybody at as well um but in general just please come on out and support our athletic programs we're extremely excited about the student athletes that are on our field, um, and, and they're, they're wonderful. They're wonderful human beings, they're wonderful athletes, and they're great representation of our Laker community. It's going to be a fantastic fall season for Laker sports. Eric, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it, Tyler. Thanks for having me on. 
More information can be found on westbloomfieldathletics.com to keep up to date with all the teams all season long throughout the fall and learn more about sports coming up in the winter and spring seasons at WB. Kevin, a great time of the year. Sports get so, so many people excited to be back in school and be back mm -hmm. in that school environment. It builds that community and from a young age can have a massive impact on our young kids. Yeah, love it, man. It's one of the, it's that time of the year where, you know, it's just comfortable enough to stay outside and watch our kids play some sports, man. So it's that fall football season area, and, and, and we all love it, man. We come together as a community, you know, to support our youth and our athletics, and we're just looking forward to a great start to a great season. So I'm hyped up. Yeah, it'll be a great time for us here in our community, but not only are we supporting our older kids as they get back on the field, Kevin, we're supporting our young ones also That's as right. maybe they begin their athletic careers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, Tiny Tyke, Tyke Soccer is actually going to be kicking off literally. That'll be Wednesday, September 4th at Marsh Bank Park. It's an exciting program that teaches basic soccer skills for the youth in our community. And actually joining us right here on the Splash Live to talk a little bit more about that program, coordinator for Challenger Sports' Michigan Tiny Tykes program, we have Dylan Burks joining us. Thank you for being here, Dylan. Good morning, how are you guys? Doing just great, doing just great. Want to kind of dissect this program that we have with uh, Tiny Tyke. So let's get into it. What are some of these key skills that we said we're going to be teaching the young athletes on West Bloomfield at the Tiny Tyke's, uh, Tiny Tyke's soccer program? Yeah, so like you said, like it's the introduction to soccer. It's like the first touches that these kids have of our soccer ball. Like we make it very... Um, fundamental movement based so it's like you know we do a lot of like the running stuff and the jumping and it's like gaining your movements while using your your soccer ball and it's like where you'll start with your like first foot skills on your soccer ball and it's very like your soccer ball is yours for your session um so it's just like a good way okay. to have people like have kids introduced into the sport of soccer Nice, nice. So, okay, so it's giving them all the opportunity instead of, like, sharing the ball. I mean, I'm pretty sure there'll be moments of that, but they all get their own individual ball to kind of work on their skills individually, one-on-one -on -one style. I like that. So how are we doing that, especially with the youth, in a fun and engaging way? <clears throat> yeah, so every, um, every session in our curriculum has a story base to it. So whether we have, like, superheroes are... We have dragons, we have down at the farms. So we have like four or five activities per session and they're all based around this like one story and they're all parts of the story. So because we are mm. telling the story, it's a good way to, you know, keep them actually engaged in it um, and they enjoy getting involved in the story and playing out like different parts of the story throughout the session. Man, that's a, that's very interesting. Okay, and that's creative too. I like that because, like we said, keeps their attention also. So we're we're dealing with the youth right here in West Bloomfield. So can you share any of the benefits that you personally feel West Bloomfield kids and their families can expect from participating in Tiny Tykes Tiny Tyke soccer program? Excuse me. Absolutely. So I think it's a good on the child side. I think it's a good way to be introduced to potentially a new sport. Um, we have a lot of right. like people who sign up like multiple years in a row, um, and then on the like back of that, we run other programs. So like this year, um, we ran three summer camps in West Bloomfield as well. So they sort of like bounce off okay. each other. You know, once you've done tiny tights for a few years, then you might want to take the next step up into um, our summer camps, and then like find a sport that you want to you know carry on playing into the future. Yeah, no, I get that. I get that. And I want to kind of break down how you said some of them will be here for a few years. So that kind of just talks about their development. But with us right here live on the splash, talking about the Tiny Tykes soccer program, we have the coordinator for Challenger Sports' Michigan's Tiny Tykes program, Dylan Burks being right here, answering some of the questions, including just talking about your specific look on it as a coach i guess i should say how do you adapt your coaching techniques to suit the different developmental <clears throat> stages in the young participants in the program so me personally my biggest thing especially in tiny sites is all about like your energy and being like loud and energetic and engaging with them um 
like that takes like that's first and then like all the soccer stuff is second because if you can't have the energy to have them engaged in the session then they're not gonna like uh-huh. do it no matter what it is so you keep it like like the story we discussed before like you try and mention the story like as much as you can and you keep the story going um and then even as well like interacting with the parents is a really good one because they're more likely to listen to parents than you so if you want to get the parents involved sometimes and stuff like that as well like that i've also found that that's like massively helpful into keeping them into the session nice nice and that's what it's all about getting everybody involved too the parents as well and and with that being said can we speak on that like what role do you feel like west bloomfield the the greater west bloomfield community plays and families in general play in supporting the tiny tykes program um i mean if you've attended it before and you know you think it's good you want to sign up again then like refer somebody that you know who you know you think their child might be interested in it um, because if we keep growing the program, then there's no reason why we don't continuously run it like year on year. Um, like we run it in the spring, we run it in the fall, and then we even now run Tiny Tags as part of our summer camp as well. So if you know if you right. if you've done it before and you like it, just keep putting the word out there, and then we can keep growing the growing the program. Hopefully. No, no, I get that. That's the way that we can support on and off the field, with that being said. Keep spreading the word. Keep signing up if we are interested. So, and I'm glad you were able to say it yourself. Dylan, we do appreciate your time. Any additional information that we should know about the program, anyone listening that wanted to be a part of it, how can they find out more? Absolutely. So we this year we are running from September 4th through till October 16th um, at the location that you guys mentioned before. Uh, anybody who is interested in signing up and hasn't already, um, reach out to Mike Hodgkins. Um, he is the guy from the Parks and Rec, and he like coordinates our whole program. Um, and then we send one of our trainers in to coach the coach the program. So if anyone's interested, um, reach out to him, and he can give you the next steps. Perfect. Thank you again. We appreciate your time. We appreciate your enthusiasm as you actually Absolutely. help us um, uh, encourage people to uh, sign up and do a little bit more with soccer also. We appreciate you again. Thank you so much. Once again, the coordinator for Challenger Sports is Michigan's Tiny Tyke Soccer Program, Dylan Burks. We appreciate your time, sir. Thank you. Yeah, have a good one. Absolutely, you too. Tyler, interesting that we are actually uh, promoting a little bit more soccer right here in the United States and specifically right here in the West Bloomfield area. I like that we're doing that. It's a very, very uh, uh, engaging sport. It's a little bit different from what we're used to right here in the United States. But like I said, I'm glad that we're encouraging kids to get out there and play it. Yeah, and it's a great way to get kids interested in in athletics, or even better yet, just get them out and moving and socializing and having some fun, which we all know is very healthy for those kids at a young age. And it can have an impact on them down the road at an older age, too, as we look toward West Bloomfield Laker football back on Thursday night and uh, some of those athletes that maybe started playing soccer or other sports at younger ages going to be shining on the gridiron. One of those that had a big season a year ago was Elijah Durham, a senior wide receiver for the West Bloomfield Lakers. I had a chance to talk to him this week as we preview the game about his uh, career season as a junior and how he plans to follow that up and what his goals are for 2024. Myself, I just had a lot of pro- a lot to prove and everything was for the team. You know, I had to score for the teams, get my touchdowns for the team. You know, but a lot of it was just proving what I could do and like shutting off, shutting out all the hate and all that. You know, just proving what I could do as a receiver. That's something you and I talked about before last season, too, because when you came in, I asked you, what are you hoping to accomplish in your first season on varsity? You know you've got a lot of promise, but there are people that are saying some things about you that you don't quite believe. So how did that motivate you as you started to see this is clicking, this is working last year? Uh, I mean, it motivated me a lot, you know, just like showing as like this year people don't think like I can catch and run after the catch I'm gonna show them that like last year they thought I was just a deep ball receiver but this year I'm gonna show them you know I can catch and run with the ball and just everything I can do the top touchdown scorer on the team was Cameron Flowers 14 touchdowns running and passing over here we got Elijah Durham last season 11 touchdowns receiving last season 
think he can't run after the catch. You're going to see some improvement from Elijah in 2024 uh, in this season. And you know, answering back from last season, you were one of those impact players. It was you, it was Cameron, it was Rick in the skill positions, Brandon Davis, Swain. As you come back in 2024, now how do you take that next step? Uh, I feel like the next step is just bringing some young, younger guys like how I was last year and bringing them aboard, help, like, making them help out, making them get an, a role on this team and just building it from there, you know, because, I mean, we do have the guys from last year, me, Cam, Alos, but we need more guys to help, like younger guys, and we just getting them more involved this year. And as you come into this year, too, uh, and I talked to Coach Hilbers about this, kind of a good problem to have in the quarterback room. You got a lot of talent there between Jamal and, and coming back, Bo Jackson coming in. Brody Pecor has played a lot of quarterback in the last couple of seasons for this team. So how have you managed that as a wide receiver, working with different quarterbacks leading that offense? Uh, me and Jamal had a lot of, like, well, a lot of chemistry because, you know, I played JV my sophomore year. He was a quarterback. You know, we, we built a lot of chemistry there. And Bo, I mean, we've been working since he's transferred over, you know. So it's just good to have two good quarterbacks to work with, both really good, you know. Both will play, so, you know, it will just be great to have. Take me through the dynamic, too, behind some of that work behind the scenes that you mentioned, working with Jamal, working with Bo, working with Cameron and, and other guys over the offseason to take those next steps before you even hit practice for the first day, you know, what went into that decision for you guys as you approach the season? Uh, I mean, that loss in the semifinals, it was tough, you know, and we don't want that feeling again. So we just had to, like, we had to build. So we started it as soon as the season ended, you know, renting out indoor f fields just in the, in, the, in the cold, you know. When it got hot outside, we went on the field. It was just like work since the season ended. And that last game, you mentioned the Southfield a and loss, five-point loss, came down to the last couple of plays. And look, you can say it's the last couple of plays that made the game go the way it went, but any football player will tell you, we had so many opportunities to go over the hump throughout that game. And it wasn't just the end that ultimately gave that final result. So how do you pass that message on to the younger guys? both in, on your side of the ball on offense, but also the defensive guys where there's a lot of youth there? Uh, the, the little things matter, like, you know, everything matters. Nothing, like, nothing can be slacked off or, like, thrown away. You know, everything matters. So we just keep pushing that out. Like, every little detail matters. And for you, as you go into this season, you have that experience on the offensive side. You had a great season in 2024. Across the board for your team, what are some of the focuses for – the older players on this team, the veterans for this season that will ultimately help you get back where you were, but not just on the doorstep of Ford Field, getting to Ford Field and lifting that trophy up. Uh, leadership, you know, I've been saying to younger guys, we got to, as seniors, we got to show the younger guys like more and more and more, you know, it's just like, I mean, we got to show them what it is, it's, like, it's like to be on varsity and how to play and how to mature and be a varsity player and, and help your team. Seeing the success of players at the next level, at this point, with the success you had as a junior, with, with the success you're very likely going to have as a senior, you're going to be in that position. And looking at guys like Donovan and Makari, both named captains at the University of Michigan, Samaj Morgan and his impact as a freshman last season at Michigan, how does that further motivate you coming into your last season here at WB? Uh, seeing them come out of pro a program that I'm still in, it, it, it's very motivating seeing like how it transfers over to the next level. And it, Maj, Samaj was just my teammate, so it's just like, that's crazy how he already got a big p impact in the, on the college level. So, you know, I'm really excited to like further myself after this, this year. It's going to be an exciting season for Elijah. Following up last season, has got two great quarterbacks in the backfield with him. There's going to be so much variety to this offense. And Kevin, really excited for that first football game on Thursday. I can't wait to, man. Going to spend a lot of time out there watching, capturing things, and bringing it to CivicCenterTV.com. So I can't wait to hit the field and check them out on, uh, on the gridiron also, Tyler. Yeah, their team's been hard at work. Our team's been hard at work as well. Now will include a long day for us on Thursday, bringing you West Bloomfield Laker football coverage. In the meantime, you can keep up to date with the team, get their schedule, get your weekly episodes of This Week in Laker Football, and more on civiccentertv.com slash Lakersports. That's our show for this Wednesday in Greater West Bloomfield. Big thank you to Jake Schaff and Calvin Brown at Master Control. And alongside Kevin McIntosh, I'm Tyler Keeft. Thanks for tuning in to The Splash Live.